So has everyone gotten so far to download her or his folder? I see some nodding heads, okay. <laughs> so uh, very sorry for the delay, but uh, we did have some troubles with which computer to connect and things like that, so. This resolution is really not mine. Don't have a full screen. Okay, so um, then let's start. Uh, just one word beforehand. If I go too fast or if you have any questions, please just feel free to interrupt me um, at any time. <laughs> You, mi you might need to shout because I'll be looking at my screen, so I might not see everyone at the, every time. So, um, I would like to start with uh, some notes up front, then giving you a current status on how the standards at the moment are implemented at the ARCA Sport Europe. And along with this, we'll um, do some of the main data processing steps uh, beginning with the country managers part that we already heard of yesterday, the archival landscape, with managing institutions and accounts for the institutions. Um, then we will have a look at the content providers information, the EAG files, and then we'll see if we can do some conversion and validation for archival descriptions, so finding aids and creating a holdings guide with the data preparation tool, which I hope everyone already has downloaded. Um, then we'll do uploading uh, into the portal, for which you will need your accounts that I distributed last week, and um, indexing and publishing on the portal, which is not the real life portal, but the content checker, so our test installation that we can use freely for just trying things out. And then we'll just see what further options of data management there also would be on the uh, dashboard, which we call the, de the back end of the portal. So updates, deleting, and probably transmission of data to Europeana. So let's start with some notes up front. There are three columns, as we call them, who actually carry the archives for Europe. Um, and one thing is the data preparation, which is consisting of mapping and conversion. Uh, we are trying to apply a system of decentralized responsibility based on a joint use of international archival standards for the central installation. Um, the development and the enhancement of the tools for data conversion is done via the project, but in close cooperation with you all. So um, we, of course, need to know your data. We need to know the structure. We need to know the technical possibilities that you have in your own systems, for instance, for exporting data from the systems, et cetera, et cetera, to actually be able to adapt our tools to what you need. And we also are thinking of kind of developing the tool in that way that in the end, at some point, you would be able to adapt the tools yourselves in a not too technical way. The second column is the data integration. Here again, uh, you can actually choose the way that fits best to your own situation at home. So we have uh, harvesting via OEPMH, um, which could be done when you have a repository which is able to do OEPMH harvesting. Uh, or you could choose uh, an upload via FTP or simple HTTP, which if I'm not mistaken, most of our partners are doing at the moment. And um, data integration also refers a little bit to the aspect of interoperability with other international and national archival and cross-domain initiatives, for instance, Europeana. The third column is the data preparation. So that's a combination of central data management, 
full text indexing and an XLL transformation to HTML, so to actually see the data that you have provided on the Archives Portal Europe. And as I already mentioned in the beginning, we have a double installation with test and production environments, uh, plus actually the content checker, with, which is more or less your test environment, where you can just try your data, uh, have a look at it, how it's presented, um, and then possibly adapt if you are not that uh, satisfied yet. So hopefully, in the end, uh, we have a little nice temple like this, with the three columns carrying it. Um, and then just a word on the central data, decentralized data responsibility. Um, in our opinion, this is one of the main aspects of establishing a sustainable archives portal Europe with a minimum of additionally necessary central resources. Uh, that is, the archives portal Europe team provides the tools, the infrastructure, and the, the support necessary around this. Uh, then there would be the country managers, so you acting as intermediaries between the portal and the content providers, uh, and possibly as arrangers for their country's representation within the Archives Portal Europe by the archival landscape. And then, actually, it's more or less down to the content providers themselves. So the content providers are enabled to conduct each step of the data processing by themselves, either locally with a data preparation tool or centrally via the dashboard. Uh, they can choose the form of data delivery, um, the amount and the method, uh, fitting best to their own technical possibilities. Um, and they are the ones who decide when they are conducting these steps, um, including further delivery to Europeana and including even a deletion of their data from the portal. What have been and still are the aims with regard to using archival standards in the APEX project. Um, being a best practice network, we actually do not search for our own standards, but we try to take what already is there and adapt this to our situation. So um, the aim is building a central infrastructure based on existing international archival standards adapted for their use within a European context, which means adapted for their use in collaboration with all your local formats that we gather. And it also should, in the end, foster the use of these European profiles in order to reach more interoperability of already existing as well as upcoming national, regional, and even local archival presentations and portals. And we hope that this would, that in the end, enable all European institutions with archival holdings whose data either already exists in accordance to these standards or can be converted via the tools into these standards to participate in the Archives Portal Europe. So let's have a look at the current status, which standards are used and how we are using them. The main standard around the Archives Portal Europe is what we call APE EAD. So what is this and how is it, is it used? Uh, it's a subset of the current encoding archival description 2002. Um, it's our target format for the conversion of archival descriptions. It's the basis for validation of archival descriptions. It's the basis for the full text indexation of archival descriptions in the Archives Portal Europe in order to be searched and found sim by simple full text search, as well as applying in advanced search options with the use of refinement and sorting options for the search results. So this is actually all based on what is in your EAD files already. It's a basis for the joint presentation within the Archives Portal Europe but also allowing for local, regional, and national characteristics uh, in the data being capped. Uh, so in the end, we actually ended up with a rather large profile uh, because we just wanted to allow for optional elements that would then include information that might not be used by all partners, but just by some. And it's also the basis for a common delivery format uh, when exchanging data, for instance, with Europeana. How did it come to be and how is it further developed? 
Um, in the Apenet project, when we started all this, we actually started with comparison of the existing profiles on uses of EAD by different Apenet partners. And uh, then we took some decisions uh, to use one specific element where EAD in itself might allow different options. So for instance, we decided to use scope content in general instead of abstract, or we decided to use to uh, use control access instead of index index tree entry. Um, there also was a further development uh, based on more and new sample data. So the more data we got in from partners, uh, every time we had a more or less internal check, is, is our profile still in line with this or do we need to adapt this? Um, there, it also ended up in inclusion of more elements or more attribute values um, based on this new sam sample data when it occurred that the current mapping wasn't complete and was missing valuable information. Um, we then, when we started to actually implement APD in the Arcos Portal Europe, saw, okay, uh, we perhaps would like to have some functionalities based on this centrally used. So we started to also incorporate some small bits and pieces into our profile in order to do this. For instance, uh, including a role attribute with the element which is used for all the links to the digital archival objects in order to distinguish between different types of digital objects. And there also were, were some further development steps with regard to our exchange with Europeana. So as Europeana is um, at some point wanting certain information, we needed to make sure that this is somewhere also already in our EAD data. When speaking of EAD, we actually have also to speak about three layers in which we use EAD. And the top layer is the archival landscape, which provides an overview of the participating institutions ordered by country in the first place, and which can expand it to show each country's regional or administrative structure, or actually any kind of structure that already exists in your countries and that you would like to apply in the archival landscape as it's displayed in the Archives Portal Europe. Uh, this is horizontally linked with files in EAG, Encoded Archival Guide, to describe the constituent institutions, so contact details, opening hours in future, hopefully a little bit more information also on the con uh, institutions. And it's vertically linked with the holdings guides of the institutions. And just to give you some examples how this actually looks like in the portal, I did some screenshots. Um, so this is actually the start page. When you go to the directory, you see the list of countries and you can expand it and have a look, okay, which institutions from these countries are already participating and represented. You can also change the language, so at least the country names would be displayed in the language you chosen for the user interface of the Arcos Portal Europe in general, so even if the institutions might still be named in their own country's language, at least via the countries there is a certain um, orientation. And when you click on one of the institution's names, you will actually see all the details uh, that has, have been provided so far for these countries. And at the bottom of the page, there also is a Google map which actually zooms in directly at the point where this institution is located. And speaking of standards, I can't, I can't do this without a little bit of XML, sorry about that, but um, those of you who are a little bit more technical pro hopefully will appreciate because this actually shows you where the links between the different layers are. So uh, in this example you see that uh, we have the name of the institution um, and in the line underneath you see it's linked to the EAG XML of this institution. And this actually is another view of the archival landscape, which is in the advanced search option. So we are using the archival landscape there as well. And in this part, you can see the connection between the institution in the archival landscape and the holdings guide of the institution. 
and you could also go directly to the second display of the holding sky to see what fonts and collections are held in this institution to just have yourself a little bit more informed, which then in this case would look like this. And for this, we as well have a, a link actually in the EAD file. So um, it is in this case in the other find eight element where we would just have the identifier of the holdings guide that is linked. So how does this look like on the dashboard? And so now I would like all of you to log into your dashboard accounts at apenet dot national with two A archive A R C H I E F dot N L. Well, I'm just giving a few words on what the dashboard actually is. So um, the dashboard is the Archives Portal Europe's backend, and it's password protected, with accounts for actually each of the content providers if they like to. It's the central tool for data preparation and processing and can be used, for instance, to build the archival landscape, including the management of institution managers, creating and updating information on the archival institutions, uploading and harvesting functionalities are provided there, conversion and validation of local data to the APE formats, and further data management. When you lo have logged in, your screen should ideally look like mine here. <laughs> um, um, in the upper left, you see that you are the country manager for, country for country, country, country X. X. And uh, as Lucille already said in her presentation uh, yesterday, this is actually the view that only the country managers can see. So the institution managers, the content providers, uh, will not see the part on how to edit or do anything with the archival landscape. So let's just have a look what options we have in this menu and let's just start with the preview where if I didn't make any mistakes, actually every one of you should at least have one archive in there. I, th I think some accounts already have been used, so some accounts might have a, a bigger list. Um, but I think for most of you, uh, this would like this would look like this. And when we have a look at the portal itself, and just compare this with how the directory at the moment looks, you will see that at least my country, which is Guadeloupe, is not yet there in the directory. So the country already exists in the back end, and there actually already exists an institution for this country, but it's not shown here. And that's what I mentioned yesterday. So you can actually prepare everything in your archival landscape without it already showing up on the portal. So you're more or less kind of safe when you do something in the back end. So Let's have a look how we can edit the archival landscape. So we go to edit archival landscape. And unfortunately, I'll have to do the same as Lucille did uh, yesterday, <laughs> switching my screen. Um, and then let's 
start with creating some groups in our archival landscape. So we select the element type group, and then we, for instance, start with a group called region one. And we add this group to the list. And just because it's so much fun, we just create a region two as well, again, as a group. So you should see something like this now. One, one archive and two regions. But we also would like to do some subgroups in our groups. So we click on the region one, and then we have a little, little bit of more options that we will look at later on. Uh, we again select the element type group, and then for instance we say it's Local archives would be one of the groups. And we add this to the list. And for those of you who are using Firefox, which is currently the browser to which our installation is optimized to, uh, you should also see the subgroups a little bit indented and with the 1.1 1 .1, um, for better recognition. So we just repeat this adding a subgroup to region one. And for instance, we add some church archives. And then we also add these two subgroups to region two. So just to be sure, save it for the moment. So save one time. And then we can have a look at the preview again and just see if everything is how we wanted it to be. And so you can see in the preview that you can unfold this tree as you could also in, in the portal. but still no sign of this on the portal side. So everything that we have been doing has been in the unknown for yet, for now. So let's go back to edit the archival landscape and let's add some more archives. So we select the group or subgroup to which we want to include an archive. So for instance, the subgroup 1.1 local archives. And then we just add an archive a. And we also could repeat these steps to just fill our archival landscape a little bit. And just add some institutions in the different subgroups as you would like to do. Then someone else is using Malta. <laughs> the same for you?
I actually made some mistakes in my payment landscape. So, actually, I wanted this archive E to be in this subgroup, church archives here, which it isn't. So, how can I move it up there? So, I click on the archive that I want to move, and then I have these nice additional buttons which allow me to actually. Um, change the archival landscape a little bit. And in this case, I want to change it to another group. So I go here to select a new group, and I change to the group of church archives where I would like to edit. Click on change group, and then it's up there. And another thing that I just realized is that I also would like to have the first archive that already was there, which in my case is called German Archive 1, um, also to be in, actually in the, in the region number one. So not in one of the subgroups, but in one of the groups. So I changed this group as well. And then I actually want to appear to have this archive appear before the subgroups of this region. So I can also move this archive a little bit up in the list via the buttons here at the bottom. So I select the, the archive one and move it one step up and move it a second step up. And now I'm satisfied with how my archival landscape looks at the moment, so I'm going to save it. And now we can have a look at managing the institution managers. Of course, we already have created some institutions, and that's actually everything that we want to do as uh, country managers, so everything else should the content providers do themselves. Uh, so we go to manage institution managers. And there you actually have a list of all the institutions that you have added in your archival landscape. And at the moment, actually everything is managed by the country managers because we haven't created an institution manager yet, which we would like to do with one of the archives. So we click on Create Institution Manager. And if, if you like to also do these steps, you might ask your neighbor for her or his email address. So you could assign an institution to her or him. I'll just use a fake one. And 
when you've entered first, last name, and the email address of the manager you want to assign this institution for, you can click off to OK. <gasps> Okay, let's change. I've been using this dashboard too often, obviously. <laughs> ah. okay. So this one worked, and then your list of institution managers actually should show up the institution manager that you have just created. Could you ask you on if you could and what you could also do is once you have created one of the institution managers, depending on how the setting is, you also could assign an institution to an already existing institution manager. So for instance, when you, when you have uh, a regional archive which would deal with all the local archives in her or his region, then you could assign all these local archive accounts to the regional uh, manager. And this also shows up in our list of institution managers. And of course, you can also be mean and delete institution manager accounts again. Uh, but I won't do that yet at the moment. So, but what you can do, and what Lucille also showed in her presentation yesterday, you could change to these accounts and just give the institution managers a hand if they run into any troubles. And so you can actually have a look at, okay, how is the data displayed? Uh, what, what are the error messages that they got? And uh, then hopefully figuring out with them together uh, what went wrong and, and helping them. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm starting to put in all of my institutions, mm -hmm. and, and I was starting to put them all over the archive staff, but actually I don't really want to do that because this is the list that end users will see to navigate, so mm -hmm. they don't want that, they just want university archives or college yeah. archives or whatever. Yeah. So I've taken out archives staff, but on the other hand, if this is the only if this is the only country manager of dashboard and thinking of the future, mm -hmm. we, we're probably going to want a, a way to definitely distinguish which ones are coming through the hub and which yeah. ones aren't. Do you see mm -hmm. what I mean? So I might have to think about, yeah. about that. I, th yeah. I think for now this is the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. But then... I'll give... Ah, okay. Hmm. Ah, okay, and then... Okay. <laughs> Yeah, okay, good. Ending. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think this is the right way to do it for now. I, yeah. I, I just don't want to put in 200 institutions. Yeah, no, sure, sure, uh, sure. But, yeah, to, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm just, it might be something I need mean, to talk to you about, but yeah. I'm just thinking that from the point of view of the future and the administration of this, we're, we're probably going to end up with a system where, we, where a number of institutions come in by the heart, but I don't mm. think we should say that you have to do that. Yeah, there should yeah. be people that can become institutional managers and do it themselves. Yeah, yeah. But we, we, we'd want to know the difference. Mm. 
yeah. for now, if I just yeah. put in, I think if I just put this in, yeah, and I then think we that might that, be able yeah, to figure yes, out something. Yeah, sure, sure. But it's we, we could we could also think about um, if if this already should be in the archival landscape, or if it would be um, sufficient to have it when the objects are presented. Well, yes, yes. To, to have a distinguishing. Uh, this uh, distinction between um, this is coming from the archive directly or this is coming via an aggregator. It's going to be important for kind of any support and technical problems to kind of know, yeah. you know, so it's more, it's more in the background. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But they have a, a known country code. <laughs> really? Then, then, yes. For Guadeloupe or is it another one? For Guadeloupe. When you are explaining now, on which one of these did you go? Um, edit archival landscape. And then charges. <laughs> Over there. Yes. Ah. Okay. Well, ah. And then to add to the list, it's over here. Okay, okay. Yeah. I so was you, can, you can type. Uh -huh. Oops. It's also <laughs> down. It's also down. Yeah. Yeah. Add, so add to the list is over here. From yes. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. you, ty you type the name. The name, um, yeah. Then you add to the list. And you could now I was following you, yeah. but I was following yeah. my schedule. <laughs> So um, let's have a look at, at the next steps. So we have our institutions created and um, actually we are not just country manager and giving out institution accounts to other uh, institutions, but we are also kind of the institution manager for our own institutions. So to have the National Archives uh, presented in the Archives Portal Europe. And so we actually need to do these steps as everyone else needs to do them. Um, and it starts with describing our institution. And we are using EAG for describing the institutions, those, the encoded archival guide, um, an XML format, which is related to the international standard for describing institutions with archival holdings from the ICA. Um, it had been developed uh, in a version 0.2 by the Subdirectorate for Archives at the Spanish Ministry of Education, Culture and Sports. And uh, during the last year, um, I think nearly everyone here in the room participated in the task from Work Package 4 in the APEX project, which uh, consisted in defining a draft for a new version of EEG, which we are currently calling EEG 2012. And um, it was done in collaboration with uh, the colleagues in Spain uh, and it aimed at a better correlation with the ISTIA, since there were some chapters in ISTIA which we actually couldn't uh, encode with EEG so far. Um, and it aimed at including further development occurred in the time between 2002 and now. For instance, the publication of ECCPF, the Encoded Archival Context for Corporate Bodies, Persons and Families in 2010, uh, which is more or less the, the youngest of the e-encoding standards at the moment, so we wanted to adapt to some developments that they have done there. So we go back to the dashboard, and we click on Manage Content. And then we choose, in my case, the, the German Archive 1, uh, in your case, is the the archive that already had existed, or well, actually, you could actually you could also choose one of the archives you've just created, uh, and we click on go, and then we see this screen, which tells us what we already know that we are new to the dashboard and therefore not yet known, 
and then we should either create an EEG file or upload one. And as we don't have one to upload, we create one. So we click on create EEG file. And then you see a short form where you can enter information on your institution. Uh, it already contains the name as it was given in the archival landscape. And um, for the identifier, I'm just changing back to, to this for a moment. So the identifier of the institutions needs to be compliant to the ISO standard 15511. Ideally, if that already exists, uh, a registered ISO code, which really makes your identifier globally unique. Uh, but the main thing for now is that your identifier needs to start with your country code, then a hyphen, and then you can actually choose any kind of abbreviation for your institution that you like. The only restriction on this is that it can't be more than 13 characters. So it's country code hyphen and then you can just type something that you like. So I'm just going to use archive one as it's the most easiest. <laughs> And then you start filling in the, the other fields that are there. So just let your imagination flow a little bit. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, actually, actually, everything is mandatory in this form at the moment, uh, apart from the parallel name of archival institution, which is mainly due to the fact that these are all the mandatory elements in the old version of EAG. So we had to have these. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, we, we we know that that some of the addresses actually don't fit to everything here. But you can, yeah, you you ac you actually could also. So, for instance, we, if we don't have a postal code, we could also put, uh, no, this, in. So there there just needs to be something in the field actually. And at the bottom of the form, you actually see a thing, a, a thing called delete repository guide or add repository guide. And this is when we go back to our, When, when we go back to the um, directory, no, not a good example. Um, need to go here. <laughs> Do we have, ah, here. <laughs> so this, this button at repository guide is actually used to include a link to your own holdings guide at your own website. So you could also, already in the directory, actually lead the users to more information that you have on your own websites. So, um, 
and this would show up in the information of your institution. But as I don't yet have a link, I just delete this part. And then I'm going to validate or save what I just entered. And then it should say, your EEG file has been created correctly. I hope it does for everyone. <laughs> And when we now have a look at the directory in the portal, as soon as, as it's loaded, We are getting there. As long as it's loading, you just have to believe me that actually all the information for the archive that you've just entered and saved will now be in the directory. So I just have to reload. And that, that's actually just an addition to what I already told you when we started to create our archival landscape. As long as either you or the institution managers do not enter the information for their EAG files, the institutions won't show up on the portal. Perhaps we could have a look at this later on when the <laughs> page is loaded. Oh, no, now it's, now it is. <laughs> oh, no, it isn't, okay. Let's see this later. And so now we have the archival landscape. We have some institutions with information, but we don't have data yet. And so we are getting to the next layers in our three layer system. And the second layer is the holdings guide, uh, which is acting as an overview of all forms and collections from one institution, independent from the existence of finding aid. So you could also describe your forms and collections already in the holdings guide without yet having an online finding aid to go any de deeper in detail. Um, it's either a simple list or it's a structured hierarchy and uh, it will in future be linked to ESC CPF files on the records creators and it's vertically linked to the ED files for the finding aids with more information on, the spe on a specific form collection. So just to give you an overview how the uh, holding guides look like um, on the portal. So this would be the start page and here again you have the possibility to include a link to your own presentation at your own websites. So you, you, your, your institution, your own presentation is actually always represented somehow in the Archives Portal Europe as well. When you unfold the holdings guide, you can scroll down and kind of have a look at the different uh, form descriptions, collection descriptions. And you also see at the bottom of this page that um, you have the link to view the finding aid that's already uploaded in the Archives Portal Europe. So you can surf from the holdings guide to the finding aids. This is just another um, example of a holdings guide, which is more like a list. Um, 
with just some, some general groups. And this is how the finding aid would look like. So it would open in, a, in an extra tab or window of your browser and then you could see the finding aid with a detailed description and still go back to the Holdings Guide and looking up another finding aid if you like to. And this is how it will later on look like in the dashboard once we have uploaded our data. So in the dashboard you could also see um, if all your finding aids are linked correctly in the holdings guide. So this is the view of the holdings guide section in the content manager for the data management. And you have one column in there which shows finding aids linked and it shows the number of the finding aids linked. And you can see that uh, not for all the forms and collections that are described in the holdings guide, there already exist finding aids in this case. And so you also have the option to actually let the finding aids be shown that are not linked yet or that are missing. So just for you yourself to have an overview. And the same thing is also present in the finding aids part of the content manager. So if everything went okay, your content manager actually should look like this with a list of finding aids. And for all finding aids in the column holdings guide, you will say the name of your holdings guide to which the finding aids are linked to. And just a little bit of XML again. Um, this is done via the element other find aid in the holdings guide again which includes the identifier of the finding aid that is linked to. And in the finding aid, uh, you see that this is actually the EAD ID. So it's the identifier of the EAD file that is used for creating the link between the holdings guide and the finding aids. And then we are at the bottom layer, at the finding aids layer. Uh, which shows details for, of archival descriptions for one specific form or collection or parts of it. So we also have finding aids just dealing with a sub form or sub collection. Um, it also could in future be horizontally linked with the ECCPF files on the records creators. And it can be vertically linked to digital representations of the descriptive units. And just, just a word on this, as uh, Lucille yesterday spoke about the links in the DAO element in the EAD files. Um, we are just needing your links. So we don't include the image files themselves. We just need the links to the image files. Uh, so the image files themselves will still be on your own systems and we will just point from the archives portal Europe to your images. And Actually, this link can be, can be any kind of representation. It can be a link directly to one image. It can also be a link to a viewer. It can be a link to an HTML presentation where, um, for instance, different images are included in, in one page. Uh, so that's, again, something that actually is up to how your system in your own in, um, web websites is already built. And so you can see that um, the presentation of the digital objects within the Archives Portal Europe differs from case to case. So here we have one of the uh, new inclusions from Iceland, um, which includes nice thumbnails for their uh, digital images. And uh, also this thumbnail is not delivered to the Archives Portal Europe, but it's a link to the thumbnail that is delivered. And if that is there, we can kind of retrieve this and also include the representation of the thumbnail and how the finding aid is represented in the Archives Portal Europe. And the thumbnail then would foster as a link to the full uh, size presentation at the own institution's websites. In other cases, it might look like this. So you just have a symbol there saying, okay, there is something digital attached, but you can't really see at the moment what it is. But when you click on the symbol, you're again led to the website of the content provider. And there you can see in this case, there actually are, it's not just one image, but it's 27 images attached to this description. And you can browse through the different images at the installation of the content provider. Or it could look like this. 
so we, we actually have links to several um, images attached to this description. And when you click on one of the uh, symbols, you again are led to, in this case, a viewer um, at the content provider's website. And this, as well, is something new. Uh, we have now included some sound files, so digital sounds, and um, this actually would, when you click on the symbol, uh, directly open up in the player that is installed at your computer. And apart from this nice laptop icon that we saw in some of the presentations earlier, we also have the option uh, to distinguish between different digital objects. So we can say the object that has been digitized is either text or it's an image or it's a sound file or it's a video file, if that exists. And so these icons actually would show up on the one hand in the search results, which is where this screenshot is taken from, um, and on the other hand, also in the finding aids. So you, instead of the computer icon that was there in, in the screenshots before, you actually would see either the text icon or the sound icon. And you can do this when converting your files, and we will do it later on in, with the test files that I prepared. So you, while converting, you can say, okay, add the object type image, for instance. And that's how it would look like in the EAD file. So there's this X-Link role attribute that I already mentioned when discussing how we created Ape EAD, or sound in this case, or image, for instance. And I think before we start with the data preparation tool, we probably just all need a little break. <laughs> 